our next speaker, probably more than anyone else here, really needs no introduction. Uh, it's Boston Tea Party. He's an author, speaker, gun instructor. He's uh, got more than 13 books. Uh, he's got a new one coming out, which is the revision of his uh, hologram of liberty, the Constitution's shocking alliance with big government. And, you know, there's going to be a conflict with uh, a Tenth Amendment conflict between states and the federal government's his prediction. And I'm interested to hear what he has to say. Boston Tea Party. Thanks very much. Um, I'm from Wyoming, and uh, as the founder of Free State Wyoming, I sort of feel like a Dodge pickup truck at the Ford dealership out here. But nobody slashed my tires, and it's my third time in New Hampshire, so I feel very welcome here uh, after two Liberty Forums and my first Pork Fest. So I, I appreciate everyone's uh, friendship and uh, support of my books. Uh, my books, by the way, are over at uh, Tracy Ward's table in the Aurora Valley, number 26. We can meet over there later, yes, and thanks to Tracy for hosting uh, a small part of her table for my books. I uh, recently updated my 1997 book, Hologram of Liberty. It's got 100 new pages in it since 1997. A lot has happened in 15 years that I want to bring you up to speed on that has a big significance for uh, liberty and uh, the future of our country and, and any, any of the free state movements. Uh, we're coming to a real constitutional crisis that I'm seeing the beginnings of that within 20 years, I don't think we'll have our Constitution in its current form. And I'll get to that in a moment. First, let me bring you up to speed on sort of the history of the Constitution, who wrote it and why. Um, this may not be a surprise to a lot of you here, but the so-called founding fathers were actually two sets of guys. The first set was the Revolutionary War crowd of like Thomas Jefferson, Sam Adams, um, Patrick Henry, and so forth. After we won the revolution, after we basically made it untenable for the British to maintain occupation uh, on our shores, 10 years later, we had what's called the settlement of the revolution. Who's going to hold power in these un new United States of the 1780s and beyond? And the Jeffersonian type of folks, which I would call very libertarian, uh, agrarian, leave me alone, uh, they're not avaricious, they're not looking to build commercial empires, much less international empires. The Jeffersonian people of the day wanted something about like we, what we have here in uh, New Hampshire and Wyoming, okay? They wanted a, a leave me alone kind of ethos. However, there, that wasn't the entire part of the country. There was the, what the uh, uh, Federalists are known as the Hamiltonians. And the Hamiltonians were just itching for more state power, okay? And the Articles and Confederation didn't satisfy the Hamiltonians. So they agitated behind the scenes to get more and more and more. They used the Shays' Rebellion of 1786 as the, ooh, the, 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 the peasants are rising up against the property owners, which wasn't quite true. Um, and so they agitated for the Constitutional Convention. They went to basically the power brokers and the political uh, notorieties of the day, such as George Washington, and said, look, George, We've got to uh, have a new kind of document to run this country. We need a new system of government because the Articles of Confederation are too weak. Too weak against the rising uh, debtor class, too weak against the, the French or the British or the Indians or whatever the threat may be. So they successfully got George Washington to, to provide his imprimatur, his, his stamp of personality on the Philadelphia Convention of 1787. That's the second set of the so-called founding fathers, which uh, one author called the founding lawyers, and I'm going to keep using that because it's a great term. They were mostly lawyers. These 55 people that went to the convention in 1787, like 34 or 44, I forget the number exactly, were, were lawyers and 44 were lawyers and or politicians of the 55. None of the Revolutionary War incendiaries, such as Christopher Gadsden, Patrick Henry, uh, Tom Paine, uh, Sam Adams, none of those guys were there. Jefferson was serving in Paris as our uh, envoy to uh, the court. And so you basically had the Hamiltonian, mercantilist, we want a strong central government crowd that A, agitated for the con uh, Constitutional Convention, B, wrote the document, C, propagandized the document through the Federalist Papers written by Hamilton, Jay, and Madison under an alias because they didn't want the fact that 
they were the authors of the uh, Constitution trying to sell it to the ratifying conventions of the states, and C, basically the Federalists, uh, when they took over the uh, first government, the, the federal government, were all in power. So the history of the Constitution from beginning, middle to end, all points to statism, just the history of it. Okay? The details of the Constitution regarding that point are even more compelling. I'll give you a quick overview of what uh, anti-federalists were concerned about. Um, federal statute is the, quote, supreme law of the land. It displaces state and local law. Well, that's a bummer. Congress is virtually unlimited in legislative possibilities under the so-called necessary and proper clause, very important clause, kind of an overlay clause that activates other things. Uh, Congress is virtually unlimited in the scope of direct taxation under the, for the general welfare clause. Uh, treaties give the feds municipal police power, usurping the states. The Senate impeaches its own members. How fair is that? Uh, the judiciary has no check or balance by the states or the people. The judiciary decides if the federal actions are unconstitutional. You know, family members judging own family members, so to speak. There should have been a, a, a uh, extra jurisdictional court to judge the feds, not the feds themselves. Uh, the judiciary interprets the so-called spirit of the Constitution through the equity clause. States are helpless against federal tyranny, militias in the federal hands when activated. And amendment process is basically in the hands of Congress. Um, in Switzerland, the people can uh, activate a proposed amend amendment through a referendum, okay? And I think the provinces, uh, the cantons in Switzerland have a way to do that too. Here in this country, the people Neither the people nor the states can initiate, initiate a new constitutional amendment. That has to be passed by Congress first, then they send it out to the states for ratification. This is a, a total block on, on changing some things that we needed to change. Um, I mean, the thing was a rigged game. I call the Constitution a coup d'etat, a sham from the beginning. The only reason we have a semblance of any freedom 225 years later is because of the Bill of Rights. As weak as they were, and as limited as they were, and as few as they were, at least they've been speed bumps in the road of tyranny, maybe a pothole or two. Otherwise, it would have been a superhighway since 1785, and you know, there would be no free state project anywhere because we'd be li living under a really totalitarian European-style state long ago. So I'm very grateful to uh, Patrick Henry and, and fellows of, of that nature passing or, or agitating for the uh, Bill of Rights. Um, however, they've been interpreted by the Supreme Court over the years to practically nothingness. You know, even the Heller case uh, for the Second Amendment, finally, finally they give us in 2008 an individual right, you know, interpretation. But we can, you know, limit that right uh, because of, you know, unusual and dangerous weapons, you know, whatever those are. So the whole thing is a rigged game, and I, I'm... It, it angers me that good Republican conservative types that are 80 percent, you know, our, our uh, direction are still, well, what about foreign policy or what about this or what about this? We just need to go back to the Constitution. It's like, no, we're living under the Constitution. I don't think there's anything the feds are doing today that cannot be justified under the Constitution, especially with a compliant uh, judiciary. So. We're under the Constitution. You know, what do we do from here? And this is why I wrote the book in 97. And after that, I had the idea for a free state movement and started my novel, and then that was parallel de development with Jason Soren's idea uh, at the same time. So, you know, localism and uh, agora society and all that, th th these are ideas whose time has come. But, man, we are, we are late in the game on this because our powers that be are, are quite entrenched popularly supported, and they're well-funded, okay? There are a lot of people that don't want what we want and don't want what we have and are going to resist us. So I'll get into what are some ways that maybe we can use uh, the system against itself. That's going to be the basis of my talk. I'll give you just a little more overview of the Constitution before I move on. You know, people say the Constitution is, is a... Uh, bulwark of liberty. And I say, on what evidence? The national motivations of its, fa of its framers, the secrecy of the federal con uh, convention, the guile of its paper handcuffs, checks and balances, 
the interpretive powers given to the Supreme Court, the magnitude of implied powers available, the fraud, mischief, and deviousness of the Constitution's promotion, the slanderous abuse of sincere anti-federalists, the deceitful assuagement of the people, the forced shrill haste of the ratification schedule, the deluded, grudging, perfunctory Bill of Rights, the brute extortion of sovereign Rhode Island. Rhode Island wanted to stay out. Congress voted on a trade embargo of Rhode Island in 1790. And Rhode Island knuckled under like a month later. And finally, in the, in the 220-something year of the Constitution's ex execution, as Lysander Spooner said, I mean, the Constitution has either authorized such a government as we have had or has been powerless to prevent it. I mean, he said that in 1870. Either the Constitution set it up or is too weak to prevent it. So it, it's time for conservative folks to, like, wake up and get past this whole parchment worship. Uh, you know, good people like... Thanks, Bill. Especially the scholars. I mean, especially, uh, you know, Judge Napolitano, for, for a good example. Uh, he spoke at Liberty Forum uh, 2010. And uh, I handed him a copy of this. And he goes, you already sent me this. And I said, yeah, Judge, maybe we'll read the second one. You know. In his book in 2006, he says, the torturing and twisting of the plain language of the Constitution in order to permit the expansion of the, of the federal powers has resulted in the loss of liberty. Tortured and twisting of the plain language. And then he goes on to say, the Commerce Clause was written to keep commerce between the states regular, not to enable Congress to regulate every aspect of the movement of goods from one state to another. So the Constitution we have today is nowhere near the beautiful, balanced document or in instrument of limited government. I mean, is he kidding me? Plain language, twisted later by, by Marshall and Hamilton and all that? Hamilton wrote in the twisted language, wrote in the vagueness, wrote in the loopholes to be filled. This was all on purpose. I'll give you the prime example. If you want to hear a smoking gun, because people say prove it. You know, this is, this is all subjective. All right, Federalist Paper 17, written by uh, Alexander Hamilton. Okay, this is to help ratify the Constitution. Hadn't been passed yet. The states are, like, nervous about this. Hamilton says, The administration of private justice between the citizens of the same state, the supervision of agriculture, and of other concerns of a similar nature, all those things, in short, which are proper to be provided for by local legislation, can never be desirable cares of a general jurisdiction. Sounds great, but he was lying through his teeth because three years later on his report on the manufacturers, this is after the federal government is in power, he says, what regulation of commerce, he means interstate commerce, does not extend to the internal commerce of every state? He knew the Commerce Clause was the loophole that they were going to use over the centuries to get us the national tyrannical government we had today, regulating everything from axles to yarn to xylophones and your health, as the chiropractor uh, said earlier. Smoking gun. Another one um, regarding the Bank of the United States. Big argument between Jefferson and Hamilton over the necessary and proper clause. And Jefferson said necessary means necessary, meaning without it, it can't be done. Not helpful, not expedient. And Hamilton replied, well, I mean, I'm not reading the, the word necessary as if absolutely had been affixed to it, like absolutely necessary which is what they did in the Constitution. They affixed absolutely necessary when they're restricting the states and if they could coin money. That's in Article 1, Section 10, if I recall. So if you, if you go back forensically and look at the document, you can see where they know exactly how to restrict the states or the people when they wanted to, which was often. And at the same time, they knew how to leave things open and vague and mushy for the feds. Okay. And over time, the Constitution has, has allowed a federal government to evolve into the system that they always wanted but knew that they couldn't get in the day with that Jeffersonian climate. That's where we are today. That's the overview of basically what happened with the Constitution. All right, let me focus now on uh, the Commerce Clause. This was the alleged reason for the Constitution in the first place because the, the states were having commerce wars, you know, charging tariffs against each other. And we can't have that. We're not going to have smooth commerce throughout the country if the states are entering, you know, if you, if me, you know, back and forth. 
So we have to have a new government, they said, to do this. Under the Articles of Confederation, no state without the consent of Congress shall lay any impost or duties or, uh, sorry, this is in the Constitution. No state shall lay any impost or duties or uh, imports and exports except what may be absolutely necessary for executing inspection laws. That covers the, the commerce clause, I mean the uh, commerce war issue between the states. That one clause in Article 1, Section 10, saying states can't levy taxes on each other, covers the issue. Here's where they went further in the Constitution and why. They added this other clause, which is totally unnecessary to the first one that I just read. The Congress shall have, have power to regulate commerce, dot, 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 among the several states. That's the so-called interstate commerce clause. Okay? That was not necessary. Article 183 was not necessary because of Article 110.2. They wanted that in there because they knew through Commerce Clause, they could tend to regulate everything over time. And uh, Justice Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall, started that pretty quickly um, in the early 1800s. Now we're getting to, uh, you know, in the 21st century, states finally starting to resist this notion that they're mere administrative lines on a federal map. You know, what about our, or don't we have autonomous states? you know, for state issues and state prerogatives like, like they promised us in the Federalist Papers? You know, doesn't it matter that you live in Utah versus Minnesota? Aren't there different laws and different cultures, different mores, different ex expectation cultures and so forth? States regulating things differently. The grand experiment of democracy, right? 50 laboratories, you know, working out how, how we can self-govern. Isn't that the, the uh, mythology? Yeah, it is the mythology, but it's only that. It's only mythology. Now we're seeing, over time, the states being smeared into nothingness. It doesn't matter where you live because some federal law or some federal judge says, no, we're going to do it the federal way. Okay? The states are getting pissed off about this, and it's about damn time. Okay? We're seeing, finally, Medical marijuana initiatives, they get struck down by a federal judge, but at least, you know, they're doing it. That wasn't enough. Now the states are really getting pissed off. Nine states have passed Firearm Freedoms Acts. This is huge. This is the first real shot across the bow of the Federal Commerce Clause power in the Constitution. Nine states, and uh, I could read them to you, and you're going to notice one state is missing. And what state do you think is missing? Yeah, we have, uh, the states are, hold on. Okay, in, no, in, in alphabetical order, not, not uh, date of ratification. Nine states have passed FFAs, Alaska, Arizona, Idaho, Kansas, Montana, South Dakota, Tennessee, Utah, and Wyoming. Uh, New Hampshire needs this too, okay? Big Tenth Amendment issue. Of the nine states, and I'll, this is my only crow for Wyoming, but uh, they deserve this prop, only Wyoming has enforcement powers against the feds who arrest, who try to arrest someone making their own guns in Wyoming, okay, and keeping them in Wyoming. And listen to this. This, this has real teeth. And this, this, this could have been any state, but, but happily it was Wyoming that did this, and maybe other states will do it too. This is Wyoming law. Any official, agent, or employee of the United States government who enforces or attempts to enforce any act, order, law, statute, rule, or regulation of the United States government upon a personal firearm, a firearm accessory, or ammunition that is manufactured commercially or privately in Wyoming and that remains exclusively within the borders of Wyoming shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and, upon conviction, shall be subject to imprisonment for not more than one year and a fine not more than $2,000. And then the uh, Attorney General is activated on this, too. Uh, nine FFAs, thank you. Yeah, real teeth, okay? It, it shows where, where we've come, you know? When state governments are starting to assert their rights against the federal government, I mean, that's getting pretty interesting. And as libertarians, or anarchists especially, I would, I would suggest let's not throw out that baby with the bathwater. Let's use whatever we can to roll back first federal oppression, and then we can work on state oppression at the same time or in a different way. But, you know, you've got a state attorney generals filing suit, okay, against the federal government on this, on a Tenth Amendment issue. 
Um, that's big. We, we need to not ignore that. We need to support that. Because if we had a Jeffersonian republic, which we did briefly, but if we had that again, that would go a long way in taking you know, off a lot of stress and anxiety and just the hassles of this life. It wouldn't be perfect from a minarchist or anarchist standpoint, but it would be 80% there. Okay? So ironically, the state governments can be a part of reducing federal tyranny. And that's something to uh, not only be aware of, but to encourage, I think. So uh, I, I would propose that the people of the FSP make that an initiative to get their own uh, Firearm Freedom Act passed in New Hampshire. The language is quite clear. Nine states have done it. Uh, this is not controversial. Has it, has it come up for a vote? I'm not aware of this. Yes? Anybody know if it's even come up for a vote? Yeah? Okay. Okay, the uh, biggest interstate commerce clause 10th Amendment battle right now is, I mean, it is so topical, it was either going to be decided today or it will be decided next week by the Supreme Court, is Obamacare. Okay, this is a very interesting case from a constitutional perspective. Now, the feds, since the 1940s, have been able to prohibit uh, our activities based on it, af it affects interstate commerce. Uh, the 1941 case of um, Filburn, he was a wheat grower, decided not to abide by you know, federal mandates during the war about growing uh, wheat at a certain rate, a certain price, grew his own, like he pleased, sold it for what he wanted to, and uh, got fined 120 bucks and took it all the way to the Supreme Court saying, I have a right to grow my own wheat. Interstate Commerce Clause doesn't, you know, shouldn't intrude on my right to grow my own wheat. And the Supreme Court enacted a new doctrine called the Substantial Effects uh, Doctrine. Basically, the fact that you grow your own wheat means you're no longer buying wheat in the interstate market, so you're affecting the interstate market for wheat. I'm not kidding, okay? <laughs> you affect it. So, yeah, but we can thus regulate it. They've used that, the FDR court has used that since the 40s and just stacked on and stacked on and stacked on. That's what, how the whole uh, Gun-Free School Zone Act of uh, 96, I think it was, uh, was passed. Because, you know, school children getting shot with guns, you know, affects interstate commerce. So, therefore, we can, you know, instead of three federal laws, you know, originally, there, there are hundreds. Tell them I'm not here whoever that is. Thanks. So Scalia is the only justice really that's starting to go, you know what, it affects it was interstate commerce. I mean, that could be anything. He said that in U.S. v. Prince or Lopez back in, in 96. He's like, it may be time to like revisit this. I know I'm the only one saying it, but you know, eventually we, we may need to revisit this because the, theoretically this is just limitless. And the limit, limitless um, uh, example of this has come forth with Obamacare. Instead of merely prohibiting us from doing something, Obamacare, through the individual mandate, seeks to force us to do something, to pay for something against our will. That's never really happened under uh, Commerce Clause legislation. This is tectonic, because if they can not only prohibit us from doing things, you know, you can't dance, that's one thing. But then also saying, you gotta dance, that's a whole nother thing, you know? That's like, you know, in the old Western where they're phew, phew, dance, bang, bang, bang at their feet, and you're like, okay, woo, and all that. I mean, this is where we're come to. You know, we're, we're, some, we're like Festus in the old West, and, you know, the, the big bully with his six-shooter is, you know, making Festus dance. This is what's going to happen if the Supreme Court upholds individual mandate. Huge. And the justices know it. I uh, listened to uh, the three days of the oral argument. I read the transcript of that. I read a lot of uh, cases. Uh, most uh, federal cases have... Up, 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 upheld the individual mandate and Obamacare leading up to all this. There's only been a couple, I think it was the 11th Circuit, that, that uh, uh, turned it down. But most federal courts think this is okay, think that the feds have the right to make you do something. And their rationale is this. It's very clever. It's not right, but it's still clever. It says, we're human beings. We're all going to be sick at some day in our life, okay? You're going to buy health care products or services someday in your life. That's a given. You know, saying that I'm not buying insurance because, you know, I'm healthy and I provide for my own, uh, you know, diet and exercise and health care and all that. 
yeah, that may be true for a while, but someday you'll get sick or you'll break a leg or whatever. Then you're going to come crying to us, the insurance you know, uh, part of things, and you're going to pay higher costs because you haven't been funding this whole thing all along. So we're going to make you get in the market now. We're going to make you, you're already in the market. You're, we're just going to make you realize that you're in the market now by forcing you to pay, you know, is it $1,400 or something like that a year for, for the basic package, as if that price will stay static. Um, you're already in the healthcare market just by being alive, apparently. And, you know, the rationale of, of, of this is by being alive, you affect interstate commerce theoretically, right? You know, if, if I die tomorrow, interstate commerce is affected by 0. .000 or whatever. You know, the same for every, every one of us. So these justices know that, that, that this is a real fork in the road constitutionally regarding the Tenth Amendment and the Commerce Clause. They know this is huge. Um, I think they've got basically, basically got four and four, four liberals on one side. Uh, Ginsburg just was, was, was panting over, you know, wanting to pass this and the oral uh, briefing. It was just silly. Well, wouldn't you agree that it has this? You know, it's just baiting the attorney general. Um, four justices, conservative side, um, probably do not want this. Obviously, Thomas doesn't. Scalia is very antagonistic against it. Roberts and Alito. The swing vote, this is the most empower, powerful person in the country uh, within the next few days, is probably Justice Kennedy. He's known to be the centrist, and he swings both ways. He's the bisexual, you know, constitutional justice out there. He goes both ways. You know, whoever shows more thigh, you know, that day he, he goes home with. So <laughs> we'll see next week who, who showed more thigh over this issue. And I, I forecast in my book, so it's, it's in print, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in print is, and going to be right or wrong about this in a week. I think probably Kennedy will swing over to the liberal side and they'll uphold uh, Obamacare, including the individual mandate. I could be wrong, and I, I hope I am in some respects, um, because if they gut individual mandate, it guts the entire Obamacare. You know, the point of an individual mandate was to force you, you look, you're young and pretty and healthy, and you know, you, you're fit and middle-aged and so forth. You may not be buying insurance because you don't need it, you know. I don't either. But uh, they're going to force us to, to get into this and pay for all the fat asses on their couches eating Doritos, watching Fox and all this other crap on TV that have a crap diet through their mind and a crap diet through their body. And we're supposed to, uh, to, to pay for these bastards, you know. I'd, I'd like to enjoy the fruits of my labor and the money that I make and the health that I've earned through denying myself of all the goodies and Krispy Kreme donuts and, you know, 20 hours of TV watching on the couch. I'd like to enjoy that. And I don't want these goddamn parasites on my back anymore. So. But the parasites don't want to give up. And they have four and maybe five allies on the Supreme Court. Okay, and we're going to know next week about this. If they do uphold individual mandate, I will be wrong technically, but that will be very interesting for the, for the future of liberty and resistance in this country. I think a lot of states will try to nullify that. Okay? They've tried to, uh, through the Firearm Freedoms Act, basically nullify ATF regulation through the Commerce Clause, and I think they're going to try to nullify the individual mandate if it's upheld. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Okay, because I, I see some parallels. I see some, you know, like we're, you know, 1770, 1755 to 1760s, you know, where dissatisfaction with the king and the British occupation was brewing. Okay, I'm seeing that today. Uh, same thing on, on the uh, Civil War, you know, pre-Civil War era. You know, the, the states trying to nullify federal laws that the, uh, the southern states didn't care for. This is all coming to pass again. So what we need today and what we, we, what we don't have that they did have in the 1700s and in the 1800s was a really strong and deep knowledge of constitutional law, of what natural law is and what is the right to govern and, and the correct sphere of that. Uh, they had that then, but we've been distracted. We've become a very soft, weak, and shallow people in general, not speaking to this crowd, obviously. But, you know, we're outnumbered by, by people that just don't know what's going on. Okay, so we've got to become educated on this so we can help educate other people and maybe change the mother culture significantly where the states have a chance to back the feds off, okay? I mentioned earlier that I thought um, 
within 20 years we're not going to have the same constitution. Um, I said this in 97 that, that eventually we're going to, the constitution will be replaced or abrogated or, or just swapped out for something else. They've already written this thing. Have you heard about the so-called new state, the constitution for the new states of America? Anybody heard of this? Very arcane document. It was written in the 70s over a 10-year period, funded um, with a total of $25 million. It was this liberal think tank in um, California. And the guys behind it were Rockefeller, Kissinger, uh, Rexford Tugwell, who wrote a world constitution, very UN socialistic kind of document. Um, they're behind the so-called New States Constitution. And it's, it's the most thorough document of its type that I've seen. They may have others that, that, that they like better that they'll try. But this one is at least public. Um, Sweetliberty.org has it, but you could uh, uh, go to DuckDuckGo or StartPage or some cookie-free search engine. Don't use Google, please, because they just track what you do and you know, sell, sell the information to other folks. Uh, but look up Constitution for the New States of America. Basically, the 50 states become 10 new states. Um, and this is very possible to get rammed down our throat during yet a second constitutional convention. The first one in 1787 was an effing disaster. Okay? It got us the constitution we have now under false promises. The next one, I don't think they're going to have false promises. You know? They're just going to say, this is it, and you know, tough, eat it. Basically, it's three new branches of government besides the other three. There's a regulatory branch to control our daily lives and commerce, a planning branch to centrally puppeteer the national economy and industrial policy, and an electoral branch. It's got two vice presidents. It's got a, a new spying thought police headed by a guy called the Intendant. Uh, there are no rights, only privileges and responsibilities. There's no just compensation for a publicly stolen property, merely compensation. No due process. The practice of religion is merely privileged. Um, amendments from the Senate, this is interesting, making use of advances of managerial competence would automatically pass unless disapproved by a majority. Okay, it's not a majority approves something, Something has to be disapproved by a majority. Uh, the word emergency appears often, 12 times, without being defined. I mean, you can see where this is going. Um, I think what is going to happen is we're going to be forced into a constitutional crisis, whether, whether contrived or partially contrived. And then these smooth bastards that know how to run these things are going to say, well, you know, it's a new century, time for a new government, it's a new kind of future and all that, and we need a new you know, operating principle of government. We need a new constitution. And they're going to, to fast track a constitutional convention within the next 10 years, I think, certainly within 20 years. This just can't go on for another 20 years. There'll, there'll, there'll be secessionist uh, pressures that uh, cannot be contained in 20 years and so forth. So they've got to really knit together finally. And the Constitution was the interim you know, uh, part of their control. But they've got to knit together this finally once and for all. Oh, by the way, your, your uh, right to bear arms, what do you think happens to that? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll read you the language. Here we go. Article 1B, Section 8 reads, There shall be a responsibility to avoid violence and to keep the peace. For this reason, the bearing of arms or possession of lethal weapons shall be confined to the police, members of the armed forces, and those licensed under law. Well, screw them. You know, I'm, I'm not getting a license, neither are you. All right, so we're basically having uh, these, these guys' plans are coming against folks like us, and we are increasingly an incompressible core, okay? There's not much shit we're going to take for too much longer, all right? It's not going to go on for another 20 years, okay? Something's going to give. Now, some people would say, well, instead of, um, you know, risking a new constitution, why don't we fix the one, you know, that we have? And, okay, I used to think that too, until I came up with a list of what I think we'd need to fix. Okay, you all sitting down, to, you know, very comfortable? This, this will take a little while. Uh, the necessary and proper clause that needs to be changed to absolutely indispensable and wholly proper. Uh, the term United States to, be, to become non-operative in law. The term states to mean just the 50 states, the term federal government to mean the federal government, the term federal territory to mean federal uh, territory. Right now in law, the term United States can mean any one of three things, 
It can mean the country at large vis-a-vis -vis other countries. It can mean just the feds or just the states. But it's up to you to like squeeze whatever uh, law that they've quoted, the term United States, and find out what they mean. This is real important in tax jurisdiction, uh, by the way. Uh, federal code titles to be prefaced by a chapter of all definitions instead of sticking it at the end. Um, allow independent submission by and ratification of constitutional amendments by the states, bypassing Congress. Uh, we should repudiate uh, Article 192, rights suspendable in an emergency doctrine. Uh, the militias need to be returned to the utter command of the state governors. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Congressional term limits in a no confidence device. Uh, all congressional votes should be made on record. They're not. Congressmen cannot exempt themselves from their own legislation or regulations. Wouldn't that be nice, you know? <laughs> Amend Article 161 to allow criminal trials and penalties for treasonous or unconstitutional legislation, you know? <laughs> Salary increases for the president, congressmen, and justices must be approved by popular referendum. Uh, re reduce or eliminate federal pensions, except maybe for disabled veterans. Uh, repeal of the 14th and 16th Amendments, and um, implementing a ceiling on overall federal taxation as a percentage of GNP. Uh, federal taxes replaced with an annual head tax due one week before the elections. A moratorium on new and a ceiling on total public debt. Monetary reform to recognize only gold and silver coin as money and prohibiting government from selling credit. <laughs> Judicial term limits and reforms. A subjugation of treaties to participatory state sanction. Sunshine law, meaning expiration of federal bureaucracies. That ought to be built in when these things are created, if they should be created. Uh, a re repudiation of the unlimited implied powers doctrine. Uh, elimination, I love this one. Uh, of the sovereign and good faith immunities for government officials and employees, you know? I was acting in good faith when I shot Mrs. Weaver in the face. Yeah. Elimination of Article 189 uh, Tribunal Civil Forfeitures and Eminent Domain and License Monopolies and Professions. I'd like that. Sixth Amendment counsel to mean any party designated by the accused, irrespective of association membership or certification by a bar, okay? Want to be my counsel? You can be my counsel. You know, in a court, that should be the law. Uh, a stronger Second Amendment binding on the states, unequivocally professing and protecting the unalienable right of nonviolent individuals to own, carry weapons without restriction, regulation, taxation, or permission. Creation of a third House of Congress to unmake law, with power also to impeach and try federal officials. Inclusion of a none of the above choice on all ballots, and if no candidate receives more votes than NOTA did, then a new election with different candidates shall be held. Yes. Fully informed jury association or amendment. Uh, strengthening of the grand juries to real independence with monopoly power to indict, especially uh, officials. Uh, due process to mean, criminally and civilly, the unanimous verdict of 12 jurors in a local county court. Unanimous. Uh, that's not true in all, all states in all cases. I'm almost done. Due process required to validate all search and arrest warrants and deprive anyone of life, liberty, and property. Due process should be required for that. Um, improperly or unconstitu unconstitutionally gained evidence to be excluded from arraignment and trial proceedings. Uh, limit the Supreme Court to seven justices, the juris jurisdiction of the inferior courts to admiralty, maritime, and piracy cases, and all other cases except Bill of Rights cases to be tried in state courts with a right of appeal to the Supreme Court. Two more. Recipient of government checks, excluding disabled vets, in my opinion, denied suffrage until they returned to the private sector. You get a government check, you don't vote in the meantime. That alone would go real far. And the last one is reform of Article 5 to bypass the Congress and state legislatures, allowing popular referendum for ratification. This is what we would need to fix this document, all right? Realistically, is any of this going to happen? No, because these are all constitutional amendments that would be required. They would have to be first passed by Congress. Congress is not going to limit themselves. Oh, okay, here's the handcuffs. Oh, click, click. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. So, what are we going to do? Basically, more of the same, okay? We're going to be free by acting free. We lost our freedom incrementally. 
we're going to have to take it back incrementally, okay? Because this, just, just like we didn't fight for every little salami slicing of freedom they took away, because it just wasn't enough, you know, okay, you know, you, to get a gun, now you have to fill out paperwork. Well, I'm going to war over that. No, we didn't, okay? And we never would have. Um, they make homeschooling a little tougher, outlawed. Uh, you know, no one's going to really resist that either. At the same time, inversely, the government, and I mean mainly the federal government, is not going to uh, prosecute and imprison people across the board for everything. They just don't have the manpower at the DOJ. So we need to, like, stretch the boundaries. I've always thought there are two boundaries in life. There's the one they teach you that exists, okay, and it's a hologram, and it looks pretty real and pretty solid. But until you go up to it and put your hand through it, you don't know it's a hologram. You don't know it's a fake boundary. It just looks like a boundary. So all my life, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. My anniversary with all this stuff is uh, in November. It'll be 20 years since I wrote my first book. So I've been, like, stretching the boundaries a long time. Thanks. And it's interesting. You think this is the boundary, and you have the balls to go up and, you know, go through it. And it's like, that's not the boundary at all. And then you step through... And you can't see that boundary because you're on the other side of the hologram. It's being projected for you in the center seeing, you know, this. You get through it, and you don't see that boundary anymore. It's behind you, okay? Then you go find the real boundary, you know? Then go act like a free person and, and find out what will get you in trouble, okay? And then, then you make your decision. Am I comfortable with this? Am I going to, you know, allow to be fine? Am I going to go to jail? Am I going to pull a gun on an armed government thug over this? You know, these are all questions you have to ask. But we have to keep pushing and pushing out. And the FSP is certainly do that. Uh, the Agora movement is certainly doing that. And the other thing I want to say, when I was on Ernie's uh, program, he was like, okay, Boston, I'm not going to give up, you know, the, uh, I'm not going to give up the moral argument of, of no government whatsoever. And I said, yeah, I understand that early. You know, it's not about, you know, your flag versus my flag or your smaller flag, smaller government flag versus their big flag. That's true. It's not for me either. But for people that believe in big flag government, I think to convince them towards limited or no government, you've got to give them the case of a smaller flag government. I think that's the harder distance um, intellectually to hurdle is from big flag to small, small flag. Once you're at small flag government, it's very easy to go to no flag, okay? But the big one is large flag to small, small flag. So don't be too impatient and uh, edgy with, you know, good-meaning Republicans, you know, people that, that would vote for Ron Paul, except he's an isolationist and I don't like his foreign policy. Be patient with people like that, because economically, on the Republican side, they're 80% there. The uh, hardcore, you know, left liberal, you know, civil rights uh, areas, they're 80% there. It's just the 20% in their own respective spheres that are keeping them from going to small flag and the no-flag government. So be patient with them. and. Uh, you know, be a good example of, of what it's like. Otherwise, if, if, if we just come across as a bunch of, you know, edgy, nutty kooks, we're never going to get them anywhere, and, and we need them. We need more numbers in this. So keep educated, keep polite, and keep stretching the boundaries, because the boundary only exists if you say so. Thanks very much for having me here. Thanks. I've got a few minutes for some Q&A, which I enjoy. Yes, sir. So if you're in Wyoming and you decide to start manufacturing cheap machine guns in your garage, right. is it something you just going to get away with that really? Because you know, you know, the question was if, if I'm in Wyoming or if one is in Wyoming manufacturing cheap machine guns, do you mean inexpensive or poorly made? I just want to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, no one, to my knowledge yet, has actually tried making even a single shot 22, you know, made in Montana or something like that, and, and selling it and all that. No one's pushed the case. That's the next thing. The state legislatures in nine states have done their part regarding uh, Firearm Freedoms Acts. It requires now one guy, you know, should be a retired guy, you know, maybe he's not feeling well, maybe he knows, you know, he's going to, you know, punch out in four or five years. What does he have to lose, you know? So he gets convicted as a felony and gets three hots in a cot in federal pen, you know. But there needs to be a test case, and that requires someone actually, you know, trying to do this. That hasn't happened yet, but it needs to. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Hmm?
Right, I absolutely agree with that. My first book was on that very topic. And in Hologram, I added this, some of the new 100 pages that are in this. I have 15 pages on, on how limited the 16th Amendment really was. You know, what income is, what constitutional income is. Income is not everything that comes in. Income is shorthand for net profit and gain from a business activity. That's been proven by many Supreme Court decisions, and that got morphed into uh, federal pay as income, and, there, and then after that, your private sector pay is treated like income. You're, you're right, technically, but we still need to uh, repeal the 16th Amendment just to remove the, the, the onus of, you know, the opportunity for them to uh, tax federal uh, private pay. So, yes, sir. Yes, Chris. Government check, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, because everyone's receiving a government check. You know, his question was, was does that include uh, federal employees and so forth? Yeah, it would, especially federal employees. If you're receiving any kind of money through the government, you're receiving it through the, through the enforcement of political power through the democratic process, and you should not be a part of that process to, to you know, affect how much money you get or if they get any at all. And if voting means so much to you, then quit your government job, you know, or get off the dole. Does that answer your question? Well, corporations don't vote. Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, you know, I, I don't think it could extend it that far, but I, I certainly see your point. I would, I would say that there some right. Yeah. A good point. But, you know, are we likely to see it? Yeah. I, it's better if people would come forward if they possibly can so that okay. everybody can hear this exchange. Yeah. Thanks. Or if you don't want to come forward, I'll repeat your question for you, you know, if you're shy about coming up. Let's have a couple more questions. You got me for five or six more minutes. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm confused about your question. Hold to what exactly? Oh, I see. You know, they could probably justify something that with executive power or necessary and proper or treaty law, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not saying that it's, it's totally kosher, even under the Constitution, but there's enough there in the Constitution where they can just, you know, have, they got a rubber stamp somewhere for that stuff. So, um, but the main thing is the feds rule against the feds. The feds decide against the feds. You know, it's like putting speed freaks in charge of the pharmacy. You know, <laughs> how's that going to end up? Question. Two more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, Dirt Time event was uh, two years ago. It was just in conjunction with uh, our Jamboree at that time. It, it's not an every year kind of thing. And I think, they, I think Dirt Time uh, changes locations depending on where they're hosted or what they want to do. So you'll just have to search for them. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here at Porkfest because our Jamboree did not overlap this year. First time that that didn't happen. So. Um, our jamboree is next weekend. If any of you are heading back out west uh, for any reason, uh, come through the northeast part of Wyoming. You can email me for more uh, instructions or directions for our jamboree. It's a uh, shooting camping weekend. It's not nearly as well organized with the infrastructure that you have here. We don't have any speakers um, or microphones. It's very impromptu, but there's anywhere between 50 and 150 of us. We've got a 500-yard rifle range uh, right next door on our private property. Uh, Saturday at barbecue, and it's a lot of fun. And, you know, porkers are welcome. So um, I hope someday to see some of you all out there. I'm over uh, with my books at Tracy Ward's uh, table number 26. I've got um, about a case of these left with me. This just came out two weeks ago. You will all be some of the very first ones to, like, have a copy of the new hologram. And it's my last political book. Um, it came up for a uh, reprint this year, and I thought, you know, I just can't let this 97 version go out forever anymore. So I spent a few months and added 100 pages to it because it's really relevant. But I want to move on to other stuff. I'm, I'm so tired of focusing so, uh, to, uh, solely on history, law, politics, the government, and all that. And I, um, I'll always write about other things, certainly with a free market, free mind viewpoint. 
but I want to do other things. So here's your chance to get my last political book uh, here in person just after it came out. And uh, I want to thank you again for your kind support and your friendship, and I look forward to talking to you all later. Bye-bye. <laughs>